College student athletes are considered the new non-traditional student, as these students have to operate in a no pain, no gain environment. Attitudes and societal expectations create both external and internal barriers that student athletes have to cope with on a day-to-day -day basis. According to Judson, attrition rates for female athletes was 32% in 2000, while for male students it was 46%. Media exposure and the substantial fin financial interest of university gain may result in students' negative perceptions of the institution and university experience. Student athletes have to balance both extracurricular activities and academics. This evidently affects time management and studying skills, ensuing possible stress, and even academic probation or attrition. Because student athletes tend to only use services provided internally within the athletic department, according to Lopez and Levy, they fail in finding advantageous professional help that may be more suitable to their needs. Student athletes are also challenged with the dumb pamper dog stereotyping from both peers and faculty members. This of course impedes academic performance as well as emotional wellness. According to Powell, it is even deemed as a racism in that the individuals in one group have a negative impact for individuals in another group. Working with student athletes can be challenging, yet it is also very rewarding. To better understand the emic perspectives of this cohort, we will use Chickering's seven vectors of student development to demonstrate a student athlete's college experience from enrollment to matriculation. This is Robert Paulson. Hello. He is a football player at his university. Just like other college students, he is developing in many different ways. Let's look at some of these changes using Chickering and Riser's Theory of Identity Development. Here we see Bob working his intellectual development in class, and his physical development in the weight room. Bob says good game after a loss, even though he feels like doing this. Bob's high school coach was very influential and taught Bob a lot. Now in college, Bob must compete without his old mentor. Bob has a diverse group of friends and teammates. They spend time together both in and out of practice. Bob gained a few pounds after overeating at Thanksgiving. He's comfortable with his body image and willing to work to stay positive. We see Bob at the beginning of the semester. He's setting realistic short and long-term goals to keep him focused. I want to be a real boy. Bob knows the NCAA regulations about athletes being paid or getting discounts. When offered, Bob said no and informed his coach of the incident right away. So what is a student affairs professional to do when working with student athletes? Here are a few suggestions. According to Hendricks, institutions must increase the number of role models for women and students of color and create opportunities for vicarious learning regarding Banderas and Gilligan's theories. Judson suggests to encourage new recruits to attend summer sessions so that they can build a support system and keep their relationship with the student positive by fully disclosing the demanding aspects he or she may face so that the student doesn't feel like the institution is exploiting him or her. Also, regarding Schlossberg's theory of mattering and marginality, Judson states that non-revenue student athletes should get a more equitable allotment of gear as well as greater access to institutional training rooms. Remember that counseling is vital within any athletic department, as emotional pain is just as imperative as physical distress. Lastly, according to Hendricks, feats such as career counseling and stress coping strategies can be much easier for any professional in knowing how to obtain cultural information, understanding the dynamics, and acknowledging cultural differences.